On Overdrive this week, Rohit gets behind the wheels of some really special vehicles. Jamshed tells us what's changed with the new Nissan Sunny. And stay with us for all the news from Auto this week. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Shireen Bhan. This week, we're going to take a break from testing our regular cars and transport ourselves back in time. The automotive world has a history of inimitable classics, exclusive cars, iconic vehicles that are time immemorial. This week, we get our hands on one such beauty. It's from the Jaguar stable. Rohit is the very, very lucky man who gets to drive this inimitable classic in its own backyard in East Sussex. Take a look. Now, generally at the start of every video, we introduce you to a car and through the course of the video, we end up reviewing it. Today, however, I'm not going to do that because what I'm going to get into is more of a time machine than a car. It's called the Jaguar E-Type. Here's a disclaimer. This video or any picture that you've seen of the E-Type doesn't do justice to its beauty. You have to see the E-Type in flesh. And when you do, you realize that every superlative you've heard about the E-Type is true. Its shape is as complex as a silkworm's cocoon and its simplistically aerodynamic body was designed with a few mathematical calculations and had no connection whatsoever with the wind tunnel. Those high-rise shotgun exhausts, the wooden metal steering wheel, the toggle switches and those oval headlamps with screens bolted onto them bring the E-Type's race car pedigree to life. The seat wasn't adjustable for recline though and the not-so-roomy cockpit meant that you couldn't stretch yourself the way you liked. You had to realign yourself to find the right driving position and when you did, driving bliss was just a push of a button away. It feels so wonderful to drive the E-Type. This is the first time I'm driving this car and I'm absolutely elated to do it because I've never really driven all these old convertibles. I'm sure they, they must have been really fun to drive back in the day, but even today, it feels so much more special. It's not, not just the wind in your hair experience. You can smell the fuel. It feels very old school. The way the engine responds, the way the gearbox responds, it just feels so special. It just takes you back in time. And it's not just the exteriors that are beautiful, even the interiors, they're so very nicely laid out. It, simplicity is one aspect of it, but the way it's all laid out, all these toggle switches, it just feels so wonderful. But it's not just the exteriors and the interiors, there's one more aspect to it. From my point of view, from where I am driving, it feels so wonderful. You have that long nose, you have this hump in between, you can also see all those scoops on the bonnet. It just makes you feel so special when you're driving this car. You don't get that sort of an experience with the new generation of roadsters when you're sitting so low, so down, uh, closer to the ground. Here it, it's, it's just a different feeling. And apart from the sight and the smell, it's also the sound. This one runs a 4.2 litre six cylinder motor. It's just a very smooth sounding engine. I just can't imagine what the V12 would be like. I was elated when I drove the F-Type, the V8S, and that was one of the best sounding cars that I have ever driven. And like I said, I just can't imagine what the E-Type V12 would be like. This one here sounds very smooth and it's perfect for a road like this, a road that is quite silent here in the UK. It's just a very smooth melody. The Jaguar E-Type is so wonderful that it actually makes me wish that I was born in the 1960s. And having driven this right now and spent some time with it, I just have fallen in love with that old world charm. But that also makes me wish that this car was instead born in the 21st century with all the 21st century mechanicals. But you know what? My wish may just have been granted. This is the Eagle E-Type. The E-Type suffix tells you that it is based on the icon from Jaguar. The Eagle prefix comes from an East Sussex based outfit that is known for the enviable showroom full of restored E-Types. 
that apart from procuring old E-types, restoring them to their pristine condition and preparing them for sale to collectors, Eagle also built some specials like the Speedster that you see here. The Speedster started as a bespoke project and its design was conceptualized by Paul Brace, Eagle's technical director. The Speedster's design takes the E-type simplicity to a whole new level. There are no bumpers, the registration plate hub is narrower and the body flows into the cabin to create a harmonious design. The cocoon is made from aluminium and so is the dashboard fascia. The seats are more comfortable and the floor pan is lowered but you won't complain because the windshield is shorter, raked further back and arced so you don't really compromise in that wind in your hair experience. This car is wonderful even for the 21st century and it's not just about the time. It can also fit in any place in the world. If it stands outside the Buckingham Palace, it will make all the Britons go wild with pride. If it drives around the gateway of India, all Indians will feel that the English still had good trade relations with us and they still traded cars with us. If it goes and stands outside the Burj Al Khalifa, I'm sure it will make the wealthiest of Arabs go weak in their knees. This is a timeless beauty really. And then is the engine, a 4.7 litre straight 6 derived from the E-Types 4.2. It is mated to Eagle's 5-speed manual transmission, which seems to keep the 460 Nm of torque ready for you to bite into as and when you want. With 314 PS of power being fed to a car that hardly weighs over 1000 kilos, the Speedster manages to sprint from 0 to 100 km an hour in under 5 seconds and can also achieve a top whack of more than 250 km an hour. What's better, you can still smell the engine fluids like you did in the E-Type. Now this is the interesting bit, you won't believe this, that while we were filming this video, I got an email that said that Jaguar is bringing back the E-Type and I'm not kidding you. Back in the 1963, they had created 12 lightweight E-Types, but the original plan was to pre create 18 of them. So the final six which were not made are now going to be put into production. Now I don't know if this is pure coincidence or would the E-Type, the Eagle E-Type have something to do with this because the way Eagle has put all the modern elements together with the old world charm and all the old world design. I think that must have got Jaguar thinking, why not we also do the same? Just a little while back in our 300th episode, we celebrated the whole idea of an open top convertible with three really fine convertibles. We had the Z4 and the Boxster and of course the Jaguar F-Type. And we really enjoyed filming that, we really enjoyed the whole drive, the way we celebrated it. But if you ask me, I think this is the true celebration of the open top convertible. It looks as beautiful as the original convertibles like the E-Type and then it has all that you need to make this car reliable even in the 21st century. I don't think it gets any better than this. Now right at the beginning of this video, I said that this car was more of a time machine than a vehicle really. And I said that because this vehicle takes you back in time to an era where cars were designed by artists and not scientists, where beauty and aesthetics were more important than things like fuel economy and emission norms. In fact, this car is so beautiful that even nature wouldn't give a dime about how much CO2 is coming out of those exhaust pipes. And thanks to Eagle, you can experience this timeless beauty even today. I'm not sure if I'll have the fortune of owning one of these, but the pride of having spent time with this and having driven the E-Type, I think that is going to remain with me for a long, long time. The bespoke Eagle Speedster is a rare gem. It costs even more than the Lamborghini, but what a beauty. We're going to give you a moment to digest that and come back with all the automotive news after this break.
welcome back. You're watching Overdrive. It's time now for us to take your queries right here on Auto Selector. Bert joins us. Hi, Bert. Our first question comes in to us from Siddharth. He wants to buy a bike with good looks, great performance, and good mileage, as well as low maintenance. He's shortlisted the Hero CBZ, the Apache RTR 180 and 160, the Yamaha FZ. He set aside a budget of 80,000 rupees and he expects the bike to return a mileage of between 45 and 55 kilometers per liter off the shot list and his requirements. What would you suggest? The performance is concerned, the RTR 180 in this uh, short list that you've listed out, uh, well, that's the more best motorcycle uh, to have. But we've said this in the past, uh, we prefer the styling of the Yamaha FZ. That's a very good looking motorcycle. Definitely better than the RTR 180 and uh, the CBZ, the Extreme, of course. Now, the Extreme, the Hero CBZ, there is a motorcycle coming out, uh, rather it's out uh, and we haven't tested it as yet, so there's not much information I can give you about that motorcycle. So I'd suggest, uh, well, stick to the RTR 180, where performance, ownership costs are concerned, mileage also is concerned, that definitely is better than either of these motorcycles as of now. We will have an update for you very shortly on the CBZ, but until then, my suggestion, stick with the RTR 180, it's probably the best bike for you there. And our final question this week comes in from Bangalore. Pavan has a budget of 20 lakh rupees. He shortlisted the Toyota Innova and the Mahindra XUV 500 of the two. What's your pick? 20 lakhs, either of these fit that uh, budget. They both come well under that price. But my suggestion is stick to the Toyota Innova. Yeah, it's a tried and tested car. Phenomenal reliability, excellent longevity. Toyota's service backup also is fantastic around the country. And overall, the Innova feels much nicer to drive, a much more car-like driving experience than that. Uh, it also has the, uh, well, the, the choice of well, seating seven people inside that, uh, that MUV. Uh, the difference between the two, of course, the Innova is an MUV, the XUV is an SUV, but having said that, the XUV isn't really capable in most off-roading conditions. However, it's a very stylish uh, Mahindra product and, of course, great set of features inside that vehicle, a lot of features that you wouldn't get in the Innova. Nevertheless, if it's uh, reliability, longevity and quality that you're looking for, dependability that you're looking for, the Innova is it. If you want a stylish package, then the XUV 500 is what you should go for. Well, good luck to all of you and thanks very much for writing into Overdrive. If you have queries, we have the answers. Send us your questions to helpdesk at overdrive.co.in. We'll get Bert to answer them for you right here on the show. On that note, it's time for us to wrap up all the headlines from the world of auto. The season opening Volkswagen Polo R Cup race came with the promise of considerable action. As things turned out, the first race was red flagged following a collision. Once it was restarted, there was unrelenting racing action between the front runners, a battle that was finally won by Karminder Singh, only to be penalised for overtaking under the yellow flag. An effective 30-second penalty meant Angad Singh Matharu won race one of the inaugural Polo R Cup race, followed by Anshul Shah and Lee Keshav. The second Polo R Cup race that weekend, which follows the reverse grid format, saw Angad start from 8th place on the grid and fight his way through the racing pack to finish in an incredible second place. Race leader Bonnie Thomas claimed his first victory of the season, followed by Anindit Reddy in third place. This week on Driven by Bridgestone, Kenichiro Yomura, Managing Director and CEO of Nissan Motors India, talks to us about Nissan's ideology of safety and reliability. Uh, safety is uh, uh, one of the most important uh, aspects uh, for the uh, uh, Nissan. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we have been uh, doing the uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, Nissan uh, Safety Driving uh, Forum. Uh, because uh, we believe the, uh, uh, there are three things necessary to uh, protect the passengers. Uh, number one, uh, as an automaker, uh, we need to uh, improve, uh, uh, install the uh, 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 safety equipment uh, like the uh, ABS uh, uh, airbags. Uh, and also, uh, uh, number two, uh, local government uh, has the uh, 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 obligation, uh, responsibility uh, to improve the uh, infrastructure uh, to uh, avoid the, uh, any hazard. Uh, and uh, also, uh, number three, uh, this is the purpose of the, uh, 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 NSDF activity. Uh, customers, passengers uh, and drivers uh, need to be uh, aware of the potential risk of the, uh, being in the car. Uh, seat belt is the uh, uh, most affordable and uh, uh, effective uh, to uh, safety e e equipment. But if you don't uh, fasten the seatbelt, it, it doesn't work. 
So uh, these three parties together, uh, we like to uh, uh, protect the uh, uh, Indian drivers and uh, uh, passengers. And Nissan is actually uh, famous uh, for the uh, reliability from the uh, uh, past. Uh, it's uh, one of our uh, uh, DNA. Uh, so uh, before we launched the vehicles, any vehicles, we go through the uh, uh, various uh, testing and uh, uh, make sure that the uh, uh, vehicles are reliable enough. Don't go anywhere because when we're back, Jamshed tells us what's changed with the new Nissan Sunny. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. The Sunny has been a household name the world over for almost half a century. The car did well in India after its launch in 2011, but after that sales started to dwindle. Largely on account of the sales and marketing deal that Nissan had with Hoover in India, which didn't really go very far. But since February this year, Nissan has decided to take matters into its own hands and it's also launched a facelifted version of the car. Jamshed went down to the exotic Andaman Islands to bring you his first impression. The Nissan brand is at a crossroad in India. Not only is it dealing with the fresh success of its new compact SUV, the Toronto, it's also dealing with the revival of a whole brand from the stable, the Datsun brand. So it's only natural to feel that some of the products like the Nissan Sunny would feel a little bit neglected. Now, despite the global success of the Sunny for decades now, in India, it's not done as well as Nissan had hoped it would. Well, now Nissan has given it a new fresh lease in life, and we're here in the beautiful islands of Andaman and Nicobar to find out how big that change really is. The most evident change to the new Nissan Sunny is the new face. There's a sharper and larger headlamp unit following the boomerang design theme seen on various other Nissan models internationally. The boxy grille mimics the styling seen on the more premium Altima and Tiana sedans. There's an abundance of chrome which adds a bit of elegance and presence, especially with the contrasting darker shades of paint. The fender design has been cleverly integrated into the new bumper and headlamp. The side profile isn't all that new with the only additions being the new Y-shaped alloy wheels that look unique. The rear end has a few modifications to the bumper and some chrome garnishing but the taillight unit remains the same. On the insides too, the new Sunny gets its fair share of changes. So you have the center console which is now finished in piano black much like in the new Micra. You still have the circular climate control unit much like well you're used to seeing in Nissan cars nowadays. You have a new, slightly modified gear shift knob. The instrument cluster is now backlit in white color. There's an all new steering wheel with a triangular design. It's a three spoke wheel, which is quite smart according to me. It gets functional um, steering mounted controls as well. But the real USP for the Sunny has always been its interior space. And well, in the new Sunny that hasn't changed, especially for the rear passengers. I think this is one of the most spacious cars in its segment. Right, in terms of the powertrain options, not a lot has changed. So you still have the same HR15 petrol engine and the diesel K9K motor on offer just as before. The HR15 petrol engine hasn't been changed at all, but the diesel K9K now gets an ECU remap for further improving the fuel efficiency. Both engines are mated to the same 5-speed manual gearbox and the petrol engine retains the CVT automatic as well. Now if you intend to drive this car on your own, I'd suggest you go in for the petrol engine with the manual gearbox. This petrol engine is nice and peppy. It's got about say 100, around about 100 PS of max power. And well, the manual gearbox specifically because the CVT, although is more efficient than the manual option, but the CVT isn't as fun to drive. Now we keep talking about the rubber band effect and you know the fact that the revs keep on building but the car really is going nowhere. Well, that continues to be the problem with the CVT petrol.
Now the diesel engine on the other hand is the same 1.4 liter K9K engine that you've seen on many Renault Nissan products. Now on some of these products, this engine makes in excess of 120 to 130 PS of max power. On this, it makes only about 86 PS of max power. And now with this ECU tweak, it's further inclined towards efficiency. Now this power might not seem inadequate as such, but you load up the car and find yourself a slope and you're going to find yourself wanting just a little bit more power. If we speak about the dynamics, nothing much has changed because you have the same suspension set up, the same dimensions and the same tyres. Now one thing we must absolutely give credit to Nissan for is that they have made safety a priority by offering ABS, EBD and a driver airbag as standard across all variants. In fact, the top-end XV variant also gets passenger and side airbags. So not only does it boast of truckloads of interior room and boot space, it is also one of the safest cars in this segment. And these are features that make it quite lucrative as a family sedan. The Nissan Sunny has always been a very unique offering to the Indian car market. Now, it was always priced a little bit on the higher side, but what it offered was plenty of interior space, some essential safety features as standard fitment across all its variants, some very nice convenience features as well. So what it's been able to do is carve a niche for itself within its segment. Now there's this other thing that the Sunny brand well benefits from, which I personally feel that Nissan India has failed to capitalize on, is heritage. Now, the Sunny, since its launch in 1966, has been a very strong foot soldier for the Nissan brand across the world. I think this is something that the Nissan India has failed to, well, get across to the Indian customers. Well, now with its split with Hoover, Nissan will take, take over the marketing and sales of all its products. Will that spell a different story for the new Sunny in India? Let's wait and find out. Well, we hope the facelifted Sunny gives the car a new lease of life in India. With that, it's a wrap on Overdrive for this week. As always, send us your feedback and suggestions. Write to us. Helpdesk at overdrive.co.in is our email address. Stay in touch with our team on Facebook and Twitter. Catch the highlights of our show on our YouTube channel. Till next week, from all of us here, goodbye. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Drive smart. It's time for yet another live life in overdrive adventure and this time we are heading to Ladakh for a unique purpose. To gaze upon the most unparalleled views of the night sky in Mercedes-Benz SUVs. For more details visit www.overdrive.in